today uh, with us uh, uh, Dr. Shemir Mueller uh, from uh, this uh, Simon Foundation, uh, where he's a research scientist and a project leader in uh, computational statistics at the Falcon Institute in New York City. Uh, he joined the Simon Foundation in 2014, and his research is in the, the area of high dimensional statistic, uh, statistical method, data science in general, and algorithm developments. Uh, he was, prior to that, he was a postdoc researcher at the Quran Institute at NYU uh, in uh, the Center for Genomics and System Biology, and also at the uh, Institute of uh, Theoretical Computer Science at TTR uh, Zurich. Uh, Dr. Müller holds an MS in computer science from Uppsala in Sweden and an MS in bioinformatics and computer science as well, and the, uh, as well the university certificate in literature and poetry. So he's an artist at that. And uh, from the University of Tübingen in Germany, uh, and his PhD is also from ETH Zurich. And it's a pleasure to have him here to talk to us about uh, some of uh, his work here. Yeah in uh, the area of microbiology, this computational microbiology, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Hami, for the in kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. You hear me? It's good, sound and everything. Okay, it's great to be here. It's going to be a truly interdisciplinary lecture. Um, I was told that I speak for a couple of minutes, and there should be no, like, questions, but if you f feel free to ask questions if, if I'm uh, completely uh, not understandable. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to go the whole pipeline from go con going from sequencing reads to ecological models. And um, I'm specifically interested in the ecology of, of, microbi of the microbiome, which uh, gained some traction in the past 10, 15 years. And I do my research at the Flatiron Institute, which is a new institute uh, within the Simons Foundation. So I will spend a little bit of time explaining where we are because we are relatively new. So we started two and a half years ago um, with the Simons Center for Data Analysis within the Simons Foundation. We are right next to the Flatiron building, which is like this beautiful building in New York City, and we are part of the Simons Foundation. So the Simons Foundation is 20 years old, but we are relatively new since 2014. And so we turned into the Flatiron Institute, which is now a fully-fledged research institute that will cover computational science in general with focus on biology, astrophysics, and quantum chemistry. And so basically now we populate this entire building now. We're going to have uh, 11 floors. And because of the vicinity, we are the Flatiron Institute. And so the general idea, so if you want to know more about us, we have a annual reports. And it's really interesting because what we try to do is like we try to solve like open problem in science over a longer period of time. And we use computation, but we, we, um, we heavily collaborate with um, our colleagues in physics and biology. We also have a, an online magazine called the Quanta Magazine, which is awesome. It's popular science, but really, really nitty gritty popular science, if you wish. And when I started this work that I present today, like right before they had um, a series about the mathematical uh, shape of things to come, and he talked a lot about sparsity, uh, as many of you may know, that this is like a key property of many data sets and how to infer that. Okay. All right. So some of you may know that our living world are mostly bacteria and microbes. And to give you a sense of scale, uh, I have this little plot about the small world uh, and the micro-universe. So on the order of magnitude, we have about 10 to the 9 people now on this planet. And if you compare that to the number of just bacteria and microbiota living on our body, it's orders of magnitudes more. Then compared to the number of stars, estimated stars in, in, in our universe, we still like, in terms of number of bacteria and viruses on, on the entire planet, it's like vastly more, okay? Um, and we try to understand now uh, the biology and the interactions on, on the scale of the microbiome, okay? 
And in general, like, there are a lot of cool statistical uh, questions going along with that. But in general, like, in the field of microbial systems biology, what you usually have is these days you can collect data, microbial population data, and I'm going to go into detail how we're going to do this. And often you have, uh, in addition, uh, environmental covariates or host covariates. So if you look at a human, for instance, you can measure a lot of other things other than uh, microbiome, obviously. But you can do this also across many different habitats. So now, nowadays we can sample, we can uh, make inquiries about uh, other habitats like the sea, uh, lakes, seas, or uh, soil. And there are many different data types uh, we get uh, out, like cross-sectional or time series. And I'm, I'm working in this computation statistics area where we try to go from these data to descriptive models of the system or even at some point predictive models of the system. And what I'm going to focus on today is how to estimate microbial species interactions from the available data we have right now. Okay? And this question like, is also a global question because it's not only that we look at humans or specific lakes. What we're recently trying to do at the Foundation too is to, to go about like, how does microbial population actually influence the entire planet because most of our biomass is bacterial, and say even in modern climate models, bacteria play, don't play a role, although they are a major source for carbon sequestration and so on. Okay? And obviously the ocean is uh, a very big habitat that we're looking at. Okay, and wh what I'm going to do now in the upcoming uh, minutes is basically tell you or try to describe how we go from these types of data to a systems view and also try to get at some of some ecological principles. All right. And we're going to use the concept of networks. And as you know, um, networks are ubiquitous in biology or across the sciences. Here are some of the major uh, network categories we currently use. But we know up to date very little about microbial association networks uh, across different habitats. OK. So one of the key motivations in, say, the health sciences is that everybody in this room most probably had at some point some sort of gut problems. Uh, and so the gut ecosystem is a very complicated ecosystem populated by tons of different bacteria, and it has long-reaching effects to other parts of the body. So we know that there are causal links to autoimmune or allergy diseases, even neurodevelopment, different types of metabolic disease like obesity, and we also know about pathogen competition uh, in, in the human gut. Okay? And what we would like to try to understand at some point is a holistic view of the gut uh, microbiota. All right. Um, why are we interested in that? The key idea is, okay, so if we knew the entire system, we could predict effects of interventions on the stability of these different microbial communities. So imagine right now your, your gut microbiota are in a, a specific state. Now you apply, you change your oral hygiene. So in your oral microbiome, you change your toothpaste. What effect does it have? When you use antibiotics, what does effect does it have? And there, is, there was a, a nice review a couple of years ago by Elizabeth Costello and co-workers that basically said, okay, so if we change this state, so to say, we go to another maybe stable state, and we can uh, picture this as sort of a landscape, and some of you might be familiar with that co concept in energy and fitness landscapes, but we don't really know uh, any of these system properties in here, and that's what we're trying to infer. Same thing holds for, oh, if you change your diet, what kind of effect does it have on, 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 the, on the gut flora, for instance, or if you take certain types of drugs? All right. So when I draw, or when people draw these types of networks, then each of these individual dots are, so to say, species that somehow interact with each other. But what does interaction actually mean? Okay? So now only recently we gained some system view of how different bacteria interact with each other. And one of the most beautiful pictures came out last year in, in, in PNAS um, by Welsh and co-workers, where they actually, what you see here is, um, um, combinatorial labeling. Each of these uh, dots are basically bacteria, different, different species. And what you see here, for instance, is a typical corn cob structure that forms in your mouth. Okay, so there's an oral microbiome on the tongue. 
and you see that there are certainly certain, uh, a certain clustering of certain bacteria and some certain physical interactions that happen. So this is one type of interaction. Also, when you have plaque formation, for instance, on your teeth, there are certain types of interactions that, that form among different species. But there are many of other different kinds of signaling interactions between cells, metabolite mediated, obviously also antibiotics mediated, and so on. And for any specific system, small scale system, for instance, you maybe can write down a state diagram where you have like individual nodes are again different types of bacterial species, and they somehow interact with each other through certain chemicals and so on. But a global view, uh, we, on a global view, view, we still don't know how all these different interactions affect all the different types of uh, bacteria we're, um, we're observing. Okay, so the microbiome field um, went through a quite uh, sharp transition in the past 20 years uh, with the um, emergence of large-scale sequencing uh, technology. So what happened is basically that some of you may know like, that we have like, large-scale genomics effort, um, effort since about 20 years, and this affected also now microbiology. So there are large-scale uh, efforts, for instance, the Human Microbiome Project or the Earth Microbiome Project that start um, to look at samples across different habitats and using sequencing to te technology to, to come about what's there, how often is it there, uh, is it present across many different types of habitats and so on. Uh, maybe one very interesting project to you also is the American Gut Project. If you want to know what's in your gut, you can send uh, your feces, for instance, to the American Gut uh, website, and then you see how you rank compared to all your other fellow Americans. Okay, then, so that's a citizen science project. Okay, so the data we're going to get, and I, I'm going to show you how this data is collected and so on, is basically in terms of, eventually, in terms of a couple of numbers uh, across different samples, and what, we, what we're going to go about is association networks among these different species. Okay. So how, how we do this, there were, there were a couple of uh, interesting uh, uh, proposals starting about uh, eight years ago. Some, some may know, I think, uh, uh, Hamid uses like inferring correlation networks from genomic service data, so Spark, and then there were a couple of nature reviews, and it, it was all about like, uh, okay, we try to understand the microbial system uh, on a, uh, using networks. And um, we um, designed a method which is called SpeakEasy, which is uh, in this paper, that uh, is trying to learn these uh, interactions from 16S uh, data. Okay. So what we basically get is from the sequencing experiments, is basically a list of relative abundance data. It's called OTU, Operational Taxonomic Units. Basically, each column is a sample site, so for instance, a different person, and each row represents a different species. And what we are trying to learn is from this data, a pipeline that goes about how do uh, these different species interact with each other from this presence or absence or relative abundance data, such that we get uh, a view in terms of a network, okay? <coughs> All right. So how do we do this in practice? So how is this, uh, the data actually generated? So again, so we, we know that there are uh, bacterial communities in every, uh, everywhere on this planet. So you have, you decide on, your, uh, on a different sample site, sampling site, for instance, the human body, different parts of the body, the lake, uh, or the soil, and what is happening is the following. So you have, in each of these different species, you have one gene, the 16S gene, that you can consider as a tag for species identity. Okay? It's a small gene, it's part of the ribosome, that if you, if you knew that from the entire organism, it's sort of like a tag, you know where it is on the phylogenetic tree. So you know exactly what type it is, say. Okay? So now what you try to do with modern sequencing technology is you try to fish out all these small genes across your entire sample. And this is called community sampling. And so basically, you try to fish out those. Okay? And then uh, we have a database available, for instance, green genes, where we have stored all the organisms we've already seen in a big database. We get all these different sequences 
and then we try to assign these sequences to a specific species we have in our database. And if it's not present in the database, we create a new entry. Okay? So you can do this now quite cheaply for a couple of tens of dollars, say. And so that's why now we can regularly sample everything you are interested in. Okay? So in the end, what you get out is basically, so all these different species are called operational taxonomic units, OTUs again. And eventually you get, because you don't really have uh, absolute abundance numbers in these measurements. How you can uh, imagine this is like you take one sample, for instance, you get uh, a relative abundance of all these different types of species in a vector. Now you take your second sample, you get different types of compositions, okay? And these data typically look like now the data we've just seen. So you have all the different species across different samples. And a black dot, for instance, would mean here that it's, it's present and white would be its absence. But each of these individual columns actually are relative abundances and they sum up to one. That's the data we have. So now, of course, this is very uh, a coarse description of the system, but we can do this now massively. And uh, this is, so to say, the, the key data we're going to use to get a systems view. All right? Okay. Conceptual challenges from a um, high-dimensional statistics point of view are mostly three. So one is the data are zero inflated, meaning tons of these entries are actually zero because these bacteria have not been measured or are actually not present in that sample. So this is a massively sparse matrix. It's intrinsically compositional, meaning you cannot do just normal multivariate statistics because your data actually are constrained to sum up to one. Then again, we are in a highly underdetermined regime. What we can detect per sample is, say, thousands of species but we cannot sample thousands of sites so far. We only have a couple of sites that we measure, say 50, but we can in principle identify hundreds or thousands of bacteria for, for each sample, okay? So we are in a regime that is uh, extremely underdetermined and like 15 years ago, we wouldn't have known how to solve it in statistics, okay? Any, any sort of problem. And then the, the question is also, I showed you different kinds of real physical, say, interactions or uh, signaling interactions, but we don't have access to this, uh, the information. All we know is these relative abundance data. So the question is, if we say, oh, a bacterium is associated with another one, what is a good measure of association? In our case, we're going to use conditional dependence in a statistical setting. Okay. All right. Okay, so I go through this. So now you know basically the input. So we have these types of data. We want to arrive at a network. How do we do this in a statistically sound manner? So the first thing is the composition, compositional aspect. And some of you may have uh, come across compositional data analysis, but it's still, it's, it is a field that has been developed in geology. If you, for instance, try to analyze the composition of rocks. And this uh, was quite quite important in geology and still is, and this is now transferred to the realm of biology since about five years. So the idea is because you have relative abundance data, you can never say, oh, one is growing compared to the other. You can only say one is more than the other. It's all relative. So the idea of compositional uh, uh, data analysis is that you actually look at so-called log ratios. So if your X is your relative abundance uh, uh, of species uh, I, and X, XJ is your relative abundance of J, you compare these by log ratios rather than, um, rather than absolutely. And the trick is, you know, like if all, all we, we are lacking, so to say, is the total amount of bacteria we have in our samples, so we are lacking that. But if you look at log ratios, everything you infer about log ratios is the same as if you had the absolute abundances because M, the total number of, of bacteria that you don't know, cancels obviously out. Okay? So the idea is that whatever you infer about these compositions is also valid for absolute abundances. So we work in this log space. Okay? Yes? You can. There are a couple of conditions that Atchison, who introduced that, imposed in terms of the geometry of the simplex, so the log is better. But you could use other, other ratios too. But th there are some nice uh, symmetry properties and invariance properties associated with the log. That's another practical aspect. So some of the bacteria, for instance, 
are orders of magnitude larger than others. So this over-dispersed data. So some bacteria maybe grow much more efficiently. So you see like in these counts you measure 10 to the 6, say. But other bacteria are also present, but they are in the tens. So you, you have a natural like... Exactly, in, in the ratios, yes. But you don't need the log to be invariant to the total. So the question was about the log. Um, so, so what we do, one specific transformation with respect, if you don't want to have um, xj, for instance, as your reference, what you can also do is the centered log ratio transform. Just basically, again, here's your composition, and g of x is your uh, geometric mean, and then you take the log. So this is called the centered log ratio transform, and in, in so to say, in, jo in drum geometric terms, what you do is your compositions that basically live on a simplex. So all these points on the simplex are now relative abundances that sum up to one, right? They are transformed into a space that is unconstrained now, but in, in one dimension lower, okay? Because you lose one degree of freedom. But now in this space, this is now an unconstrained space, there you can do much richer statistics than in this constrained space. Okay, so that's the trick we are doing. So we get the data, we do this transformation, and now we are, we are more like in a Euclidean space. Okay. All right, the next thing is how do we now, so we have the data transformed, so now how do we, uh, how do we uh, define association among things? Okay. So I want to give you like David McKay's Gaussian quiz. So a classical thing would be like, okay, so we transform the data and then we look at correlations. Right? But what, what we actually want to get at is like something like direct interactions, direct associations. And one trick we can use in statistics is the concept of conditional independence. So imagine in this, uh, in David McKay's quiz now here, is imagine these are all OTUs here and you measure their position. And this is, in, in fact, a system of springs where you have balls and then you have a constant k, your spring constant, and all you observe is the jiggling balls. But what you would like to infer are the tethers, the springs in between. So now you have access to the variation of x1 to x5. So the question is now, how does the covariance matrix of the entire system look like, or your correlation matrix, and how does the inverse look like? Okay, so if you look, obviously, in this system, everything is correlated with each other because it's connected, right? But if you look at the covariance matrix now of the system, you're going to see that, okay, so if you look at how does, for instance, x1 correlate with x5, you can go into this matrix and say, well, okay, so this number here is, for instance, 0 0.17. And correlation among x1 and x2 should be much higher, right? So it's 0 0.67, that's, that's nice. And you get like a monotonic decrease in correlation if you look along, uh, along the rows. If you look at the variance among all the different balls, of course, you see that the one in the middle has the highest variance because it gets bumps from all the others. So the beauty of that is if you invert that matrix, you get this matrix here, okay, which is called the precision or the inverse covariance matrix. If you look at that matrix, you can write, uh, rightly write off the um, structure of the network from the non-zero entries of that matrix. And these coefficients here are proportional to partial correlations. So when you look at this matrix, you can just say like, okay, so I know that one and two are connected, two and three, three and four, four and five. And that's exactly the topology of the network that you didn't know. So now we use exactly that concept for OTU data. So we are trying to infer the inverse covariance matrix, which is really the matrix inverse of this covariance matrix. Okay? All right. Another example, so if you actually look now at abundance data, so say you want to use correlations, uh, isn't it is as good as uh, uh, inverse correlation? Uh, no, it's not. So for instance, this is a real data example where we know the underlying network is actually that three is connected to one, two, and four, and there are no other connections. This is the data. If you compute the pairwise correlation matrix of that, you get this matrix here. And now you can say, well, okay, I only trust these strong correlations. Then you say set a cutoff. Okay, if you set up the cutoff too high, you're only going to get these two connections. 
and lose all the others. If your cutoff is too low, you're going to get a, a more complete network, which is also wrong. If you invert that matrix, you're going to see right away, even in finite samples, that, okay, so this is exactly the structure I, I'm looking at. So one, three is connected to all the others and there is nothing else. Okay? All right. The, the beauty of that in high dimensional statistics is now that what goes very nice, nicely together is if we have data that is sparse, we have to assume something about the underlying network. And what we're going to assume is that not all bacteria interact with all others. And this is a sparsity assumption that we can put into inference. So what we're going to do now is trying to infer this matrix even in the underdetermined regime subject to some penalties. And this is called one, this is called often the gra a sparse graphical model inference. And this is the underlying uh, procedure we have in the SpeakEasy. So you get, you don't know the underlying inverse covariance, you don't know the underlying population covariance, but what you really assume is that the inverse covariance matrix is sparse. So this is what we are trying to estimate, and this is the convex problem we are trying to solve. So this problem here is a convex problem that we can efficiently solve in a, ma in a matrix variable. And what goes in here is basically as an input, the covariance or the CLR transformed covariance that we learned from the data. So this is the input here. Um, the first part can be interpreted as a likelihood and the second part can be in interpreted as sparsity terms. So this is the L1 norm on, on, on this matrix. So this says, well, okay, among all solutions that, are, that fit that likelihood, I would like to have like a sparse um, solution, okay? All right, so this is generally useful in statistics and we specifically apply it in the microbial context. All right, again, so we're gonna go now from data to these networks and now so these associations now have a clear statistical meaning. They are these uh, sparse partial correlations among uh, log, um, log transformed variables. Okay, so how do we do uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, on benchmarks? So SE is speak easy, it's our pipeline. And here at the time, this was last year, these are, so to say, the standard methods people used in the field, Spark, C-Creep, from MIT, Pearson correlation, or just like random. And what you see here is basically IUPR curves, area under precision recall, so the higher the better. And I show you here, for instance, for P, so number of OTUs 68, and here I'm varying the number of samples I have. And what you see here for all these different columns is we generate, we have a generator of uh, artificial data where we know the underlying ground truth. And the underlying ground truth is a different types of networks. So this would be a banded network where you only have local interactions. This is a cluster network where you have, so to say, communities that interact. And a scale-free network would be something with a scale-free uh, node distribution. Okay. And what you immediately see, like our method is much better in terms of precision recall than, than most, um, most other methods. But what you also see is dependent on the underlying cluster, uh, the underlying structure of the graph, it becomes harder to infer the underlying graph properly. And that's a known phenomenon in statistics, okay? So in general, what, the, what this all means, we may hope that the underlying microbial association network is maybe not scale-free, because if it were scale-free, we, we need a lot more data in general. Sorry, I'm not following your, your graph. So the, uh, the abscissa is the number of samples. And yeah. so within each graph, OK. So we, have, we, have, we increase the number of samples. These are two different setups for how you set the weights. This kappa is the condition of the covariance matrix right. in this case. And so you have different types of how you actually set the weights of these, these graphs. And, but the idea is, okay, so you want to, you have AUPR of one would mean you perfectly recover. And now the question is, if you increase now the sample size given a fixed size network, how does your inform, uh, performance improve? And what you see here is, for instance, here, I don't know whether you can read it, but it's like 34, 6, two samples. And then we have here 1,000 uh, samples. So we are in a regime where we have many more samples than actually OTUs. Okay. 
And then all of a sudden, in this case, for instance, then we can recover the scale-free network, underlying network. But if we, if we have typical data, like, oh, just 100, we would not be able to recover anything if the underlying network were scale-free. So if you tend to have then, uh, some, some methods that kind of, kind of compete with each other, then uh, exactly. across the board, Exactly. We are always more or less significantly better, so the red and the orange, but, um, but not, I mean, none of the methods are really good. Okay, and so typical AUPR uh, curve would look like that, right? So this precision versus recall, can you, can you actually learn the underlying edges? And, and so, so we are always on top of, of the other methods. Exactly. And this is, for instance, a different case where we have now more OTUs and then also the same number of samples. So it's sort of consistent across number of uh, OTUs. All right. So now if we apply this to real data, um, we used the American gut data at the time. So these are really fellow Americans. Uh, and we want to infer the network among, among all the different OTUs. And we'll show you here, these are two different modes in SpeakEasy, how do you infer a network? And the color is by different families, so by different phylogenetic relationship of, of the different species. And what you immediately see, and we didn't put that in, is that so you get modules that have more or less the same color. So it might mean that in the, phylo, in the phylogenetic information, you have more, you actually have information about how the underlying interaction network is. Okay? So how big was this data? So this data was. Um, yeah, so P here was about 100. Um, we had like several iterations. I don't know. This is on the order of 70, I think, and data was available uh, a couple of hundred. So we were in a good regime in terms of P versus N. Um, and what we did is basically um, a robustness analysis. So we also looked at different methods, different other methods. And you see if you use like Spark or so, you get denser networks. The layout is the same, but you have many more interactions, and that's tough for biologists because then all of a sudden they have to look at many more association, potential associations among things. And what was the validation for this? So uh, the validation, this, so this is just if you apply the methods, yes. and the validation would be then, for instance, okay, we have timestamps for all the different data sets that come into this database. So now we learn across different subsets, we learn uh, networks, and then check consistency. So if you learn on a subset of data, how similar is this network compared to a network I learned with completely uh, other data, also in the database? And then we count how often we see the same number of edges. In terms of biological uh, information, you don't yes. really have any validation? No. So, so I mean, these data are very new, and so to get at like a specific system where we exactly know, oh, this bacterium interacts with that bacterium in this in this way, this is uh, work for the years to come. Okay. So, I think you have shown that your result is so similar, comparable with results from other approaches, then it's okay. I'm thinking that how about computationally? Do you do the faster than others? No, they can't be faster, in a sense, because when you look at Pearson correlation, it's quadratic. Yeah. And we try to do an inver inversion, right? Yeah. But I'm going to get at, like, computation complexity a bit. It's still convex, so it's still, for any data you're interested in, it's, it's going to be fine. If you have a couple of thousand OTUs, then this we can handle. We cannot handle 100,000, but we don't even have the sequencing technology to, to enumerate so and so many species across different samples. Say again? Other, other methods in terms of? Oh, yeah. If, if you're interested in correlation, you can compute that if, if you want to. Yeah. But, you, I mean, you, you, you're bound by quadratic things in terms of scaling, right? Because you have to look at, at pairs. Yeah. Well, the reason is that your uh, graph lasso, yeah. uh, you have this path. For certain <coughs> I say one hundred billion or billion. Yeah. That 
Absolutely, but we will never have, we will never be in this regime because the number of species that actually matter will be most probably in order of a thousand. Okay. So this is sort of the regime, okay? But we can, like, for instance, with the graphical lasso, or I'm going to show you some, some, some plots about that. We actually use quick, so uh, quadratic inverse as a method. You can scale this up to a million now. So this is more like a, I know you can do it distributedly, so this is more like a computational challenge than a theoretical one. But we, we care about computation because what we do is actually uh, in, in intensive, in essence, essence, okay? So All right. What does it mean for you, the positive interaction or negative interaction the green and the red? What it means is the definition of, so you s center log transform the data and then you get relative then you look at partial correlation among these, among these things. So it's really a statistical measure of, oh, positive or negative interaction. So in the, in the idea world, it, it would mean that on average, uh, you get like for any specific um, pair, you would say like, okay, so this is most probably more than the other on average, but I look at all the other OTUs simultaneously. Okay? So in terms of Simple, if you want to have the simplest picture you can have in mind is basically say, well, okay, how well can I predict the relative abundance of one species given all the others, and I want to have a sparse model. And these edges tell you, okay, so I can predict this by this one being positively associated and the other one negatively associated across samples. Okay? All right. And here is the network reproducibility. So if we do this many, many times and look at, say, Hamming distance across the, the, the networks we learn, across disjoint subsamples, then we see that we are more robust in a sense we get the larger core, so to say, of the network is invariant to what data we're looking at. Okay. So that's in the absence of a ground truth, we can only assess a consistency. All right. So now we, we go into the field of, okay, so if we actually want to... Maps. Correlation weights or, or simply uh, the adjacency graph. Okay. Right. Okay, so now we have this tool, so we can, we can do this learning. And so now what we did is like large scale learning. We collected all the data there was at some point last year and tried to see whether we have, in terms uh, of network topology, whether we have a common theme across habitats. Okay. So what we collected were 300, uh, more than 300 data sets um, from American Gut, from a database called MGRAST and others uh, that basically span all habitats of life. And so that entailed then, uh, all in all, we have 10 to the 5 different OTUs from 10 to the 4, order 10 to the 4 samples. Okay. And these were all different sample sites, and we learned networks for all of those. And eventually we, we came about like 301 networks of sufficient size and all in all it comprised about like 5 million associations that can be tested now. All right, so <clears throat> the question is actually now to do this on a large scale. So uh, you rightly said like, okay, so how does this scale and so on. So what I didn't tell you so far is how I actually came about like the final network I showed you. Because all I showed you was, okay, we go from data, we do some transformation, we learn the graphical model, but we actually have to do model selection. And what we do here is stability-based model selection, which is, I would say, state-of-the-art in graph learning in statistics. Okay? And so how does that work? Well, the key paper for that was from Han Liu, Catherine Roeder, and uh, Larry Busserman from, from Carnegie Mellon at the time. And so the idea is the following. So again, remember, we're going to solve this graphical lasso type objective function. And what we have to learn is, so to say, this lambda parameter here that uh, specifies, okay, how sparse is my model compared to how, how good does it fit the data. Okay? So, and if you're not interested in the graphical lasso, but any other uh, fitting versus sparsity penalty, for instance, this is a generic problem. How do you set this lambda parameter? Um, so this is uh, what stability selection is trying to solve. Okay? 
And what we're doing is the following. So we, we, try to, we try to transfer the idea of sparsity into a measure of stability. So what we say is the following. So we take our data matrix. We subsample the data matrix many, many times. And then learn on all these subsamples, we learn a network. Okay? So I take now a subsample, say, SSR. Okay? Take this, fix my lambda value here, and learn a network. So and then I get a network. So basically, all the nodes are all the same, but I get a different uh, edge set. So I do this now many, many times. And then I check afterwards, after I do this, what's the variability on each edge I infer. Okay? So I look at the true variance of this indicator. Do I see an edge over this subset, subset? Yes, no. And I sum up all these variabilities, and then I get a curve. And a typical curve for graphical uh, model selection looks like this. So here is a small lambda value. It tells you you want to have a dense network. So if all the networks you learn eventually are dense, then the variation among the edges is zero. If your lambda parameter is cranked up, you get a very sparse network. And then basically, you get always empty networks. So the variability is always zero. Okay? And in between, you have an interesting phenomenon uh, about variability. And so this is a measure of variability that basically sums up all the variabilities on each edge, scaled up to 1. And now you can say, well, now you can pick lambda based on a stability criterion. Now you can say, well, I want to have a network where in 95% of the cases, the edges are present no matter which subset I look at. And this is what stability selection is doing. Yeah, but that is in your work, right? Say again? Stability. You, uh, is it stability? No, no. It's a, it's a stability of the data. Yeah. Uh, but that's not that different from what the, real, the data really tells. The truth, right? That's a stability is a guess on the truth. Exactly. So yeah. all, all, all it measures is yeah. basically if I gave you a data set, you learn your graphical model. Then I give you a different data set. You learn a graphical model for the same regularization. How often do you see the same edges appear? Well, I'm thinking, is, in, is, is there any way to validate this using bio, uh, biology means? Uh, yes, yes, we, we will come at that, but not, I mean, so, so the idea is, so this is the entire idea of the computational approach, because we don't, for any true biological system, we so far have very few, we have very little detailed knowledge about any specific system because then you have to do molecular biology and really say like, okay, so this bacterium, which we didn't know last year, actually existed, and another bacterium, which is maybe well known, they really interact in a certain way under specific conditions in that system. So it becomes very, very um, easily very complicated. But say on average, if you look across habitats or across many samples, can you see that these relative abundances of these bugs are actually somehow related? So these associations we infer are just simply from these large-scale data, but they give us a clue about which hypothesis, which interactions to actually test. Okay? And we here look, so to say, at stability really in a consistency in, in, a, in a mathematical sense. And so the standard setting, so if you want to do that, you should, whenever you have a tuning parameter that somehow balances two things, like sparsity and, and model fit, this is one valid way to do it. And the standard setting for this beta, so for this variability, is 95%. So you want to have, for instance, like in 95% in, in of the cases, or here 0 0.05 cases, you allow variability across the edges. And this is how you then, you go along this curve, then you go down, and this is how you would select your lambda stars. So star stands for stability approach to regularized selection. It seems like you're doomed, though, because you have a limited number of n. I mean, your n is limited. Yes. And, and, and then if your n is limited, then you, these <coughs> subsamples yes. are not going to be that meaningful. Yes. I mean, this, from a theoretical point of view, what goes, you can make precise for instance, for normal data, when this approach works asymptotically. So that you actually, so if your underlying graph is sparse and you get sufficiently many data, then this is at least consistent. In practice, 
in practice, we, we don't know whether these assumptions are satisfied. So this is one, so to say, heuristic way of selecting. But at least before, we only had like sparsity as so to say measure, oh, do I want to have a thousand edges or a hundred edges? Now I transfer that sort of arbitrary selection into a stability criterion where I say, well, I, I would like to have a graph where each of the edge is actually appearing in 95% of the cases. Okay. All right, so what we did, so what this means now in, in terms of computation is if we want to go through hundreds of data sets and subsample, this costs us a lot because we need to learn these networks over and over again, right? Okay, so, so that's why people like, when you look at the standard R package, you say, well, I do 20 subsamples and this beta is here, say, 0 0.1. Okay. So now the, our question was like, okay, do we need to do this really over the entire lambda path? Do we need to do this? And how quickly converges this summary statistic dependent on n, the number of subsamples? It turns out that it's like extremely, um, uh, extremely uh, consistent even for small n, right? capital N. So just to show the stars in practice, there is of course settings where when you use stars compared to say k for cross validation, which is a practical I think to do too, it's usually better. Uh, it's also better than a Bayesian information criterion and, and, um, and uh, ICAI uh, in information criterion, for instance. Um, so we, ex we now, we extended that and said like, okay, so do we actually need to do so, so, so many subsamples? Um, and can we, can we understand, so to say, this finite sample behavior and without compromising selection quality? And then another thing is, oh, if you have now edge stability as criterion, can you use another stability criterion other than edges? And so you, as a teaser, we did that. There is a package to do that, and I show you just a few things how we, how we did it exactly. Because when you look now at concrete runtimes, if we do that, it actually takes quite a long time to do stability selection over these many subsamples, okay? So for, for instance, here, th this would be, for a, for a graph, for a random graph with 4,000 nodes, um, if you do that many, many times, you have a sample size of, say, 2,000, then for any fixed lambda, this would be the time in seconds it takes. And if you go over the entire path P, so over the entire lambda path, you have to wait a couple of seconds to do that. So this would be just for, for one, for fixed sample size. Now, now if we subsample, say at a certain ratio, we have fewer samples. We're going to redo the entire computation and then the computation blows up because we have fewer samples. The graphs we're going to infer are denser and all the algorithms we use are not so good for dense graphs. Okay? So you get an increase by an order of magnitude if you, if you do stability-based model selection okay, over the entire path. Okay? And this is due to the classical solvers we use like quick and, and graphical lasso you're going to see that if your lambda is really large, then you're going to get um, you're going to get nice conv uh, nice uh, time in seconds here. And if you get, have a smaller lambda, meaning your graphs will become denser, then your computation time blows up. All right. Okay. So what when we looked at the stability uh, criteria, we actually saw that the following. So if you have here, you have the curve for increasing n. Okay. So if you take n equals two, only two subsamples, you're going to get this blue curve variability. And if you have n equals 50, you are here. And we can also compute a, a cheap upper bound for n equals two samples. Okay. Um, what we're going to see is that, so to say, the concentration of these curves quickly converges to a common curve. So what we see already after two subsamples in our computation is that we can actually focus in on an area in, in the graph where we're going to know for fixed beta O, we're going to end up here. So what we did is by speeding up, by finding low and upper bounds, we can speed up model selection extremely by orders of magnitude. Okay? Um, exactly. So this is what we call bounded stars, and this is uh, freely available um, in the package um, Pulsar which is on, 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 our, uh, on, on uh, CRAN. Uh, 
And this is the archive paper where we actually use um, this regularization. We make it faster. And just as a teaser, maybe in the discussion, I can also say how to generalize this edge criteria. OK? All right. So now we can learn efficiently all these networks. OK? So now we have 300 networks, association networks, across different habitats. So now we can do network analysis and try to, uh, to come at organization principles of these association networks. Okay, and you can, in ecology, you can ask now a lot of questions about how these ecosystems are, are structured. And I want to give you, I think, uh, in, in the interest of time, one key question that a lot of people are interested in, and that is stability of an ecosystem. Okay, and I skip, in the interest of time, a couple of slides, but we can, uh, we can look at those uh, in the discussion if you want. Okay. Um, so... Stability of ecosystem means, okay, if you, if you look now in a natural habitat, do all the species that are th there uh, survive on, over a very long period of time? Is that system stable? So if you perturb it, for instance, by some external uh, factor, is the system still stable and can survive these perturbations? This is obviously a very important question in, in our cl uh, changing climate. And already Darwin had a very good idea about, like, what stability might mean. And he said, like, an area is, an area is more st uh, ecologically stable if it's occupied by a larger number of species. That was his definition of stability. And many, many ecologists came along. For instance, MacArthur said, well, actually, it's, a system should be more stable if there are more functions in a specific area. So are there more species that have different functions that can, say, met metabolize certain things? or can feed on different things that are in the habitat. And a very counterintuitive argument came by Robert May in 72, who basically used random matrix theory, who actually said, well, if these species are actually interacting, what I would suspect is the more species I have, it becomes more and more unlikely that all species survive if they heavily interact with each other. And he actually predicted to say, well, in a, under a random model, I should get sparser and sparser interactions among species if my system is growing. Okay? So you can make this precise with like the, my Wigner criteria and you say like, well, okay, my connectance, so the, the density in, in my interaction network should go down as 1 over d, where d is the number of species you have. Okay? So eventually, if you have many, many, many species, they should only sparsely randomly interact. So now I can try to see whether this hypothesis is true. And this is what we see in our data. Okay. So here I show you the networks. So here you see the number of OTUs I have. And here the, di the density of, 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 of the different networks I inferred using SpeakEasy. And what you see is actually, well, it actually is a very nice fit if you fit that to like a general exponential, you're going to see like my Wigner predicts like an exponent of minus 1. If I fit that robustly, I get a, an exponent of minus 1.09. Okay? So what this means basically is like, okay, so you have an area where you have high connectance when your system is small, but if you like increase in terms of system size, then you should have fewer interactions. And this does not like... Uh, cluster according to habitat. So here you see the colors are the different habitats from where these networks are from. And we don't really see like a clear structure here. But overall, now we have for the first time, we can do something like community ecology because we have sort of networks across 300 different habitats. All I showed you is not yet published, um, but uh, will be soon. Um, but this is, so to say, one of the key statistics we found when looking at across all habitats. So this would actually now suggest like, well, the simple criterion of mine, Wigner, is actually describing stability of these ecosystems quite well. What's M? M, the number of edges. So connectance is edge density. Number of edges divided by all possible uh, edges, uh, n square. Right, so it goes down. All right, so there are, there are many other opportunities. I looked now for over a year at different properties of these different networks. 
how the association network change over habitats, and I have a couple of more results that we, that we can discuss offline. Okay? All right, so I gave you now the tour going from like sequencing data to an interesting statistical problem that we try to speed up in the process of learning these microbial association networks and then coming at uh, topological analysis of these networks. And I showed you one example using the my uh, Wigner criterion. Okay? Um, yes, so if you're interested in any kind of this research, we have next month, we have a workshop at the Broad at MIT and, and Harvard. Um, and we're going to have these workshops every year. So this is the second now. The first one took place at the Simon Foundation last year. The, the next one is in uh, two, two and a half weeks. Organized by Eric Alm, Vicky Mountain, Rich Bono, and, and me. Exactly. And if you like any of these uh, of this research, also we are hiring at the Flatiron Institute, postdoctoral level and up. So if you're interested, uh, talk to me afterwards. And all of this work is not done by me alone, obviously. So one of the key drivers of this project is, is Zachary Kurtz, who um, recently defended his PhD. In the early stages of Spigisi, Emily Miraldi, who is now at Cincinnati General Hospital, uh, also worked, and Rich Bono and Martin Blazer, who were the supervisors uh, and guided this, of Zachary Kurtz, and guided this research. And Mar Martin is on the uh, biological side, so he's a microbiologist, and Rich is a computational person who's also at the foundation and at NYU. Okay, with this, I take uh, any questions. Thank you. <clears throat>